You see a man's heart for his kid, no matter what his kid has done. And that's just, if you got kids, you know exactly what that's like. It doesn't matter what your kid has done. You know, you are not, you are not that heartless to where you don't love your kids, no matter what they've done. I like these Wednesday nights. Old Testament in the, uh, on these Wednesday nights and New Testament on Sunday morning. That seems to be a good little fit right there. Murder and mayhem. That's what we look at in the Old Testament. Murder and mayhem. That's a word. Look it up. 2 Samuel chapter 17. Verse by verse through the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, the Psalms, we're kind of putting all these together, but this, this narrative just runs completely until we finish 2 Samuel. Father, we love you a lot. Thank you for your faithfulness and your love, Lord. Thank you, Lord, just that we come together as your kids, Lord, to open your word and to see what you have for us tonight. You're so faithful, Lord, so faithful, Lord. And you bless us abundantly, Lord, with, with all the things that you bless this church with, Lord. And, and Lord, you... Your desire is that we would have a relationship with you, to know you, to trust in you, Lord. No matter what goes on in this world, Lord, you're there for us. So we're going to trust in you tonight. Open Bibles and open hearts, Lord. And once again, looking into this wonderful story, Lord, of some people that are really messed up, and yet you're so faithful to them. We love you. We trust in you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen and amen. All right. So kind of looking at the life of King David here through this Second Samuel uh, book and and you have a guy that really he did love God. You cannot read the Psalms without hearing his deep love for God. But he was like so many of us. He's his own worst enemy. So he gets himself into a lustful situation, has sex with a gal. She gets pregnant. And you know the story. In order to cover up, he kills her husband, and uh, and gets confronted with that. That little moment that he had there, and that was a, actually that big moment that he had there, that moment affected the rest of his life. And, uh, and so his, the kids that he had, uh, they were killing each other and, and pitted against each other. And now we get to chapter 17 is we're kind of where we left off. You have a couple of key players that are in his life that it really didn't have to go down this way. If you kind of look at the narrative, how, how he treated Absalom and his son uh, Absalom was trying, if you remember the story, Absalom was trying to reconcile with his dad and dad was having no part of it. And it took him years, literally, before he could get with his dad and get some kind of reconciliation. But they never did, they never did fully reconcile because his heart was already turned. So Absalom took a moment, his son, David's son, King David, his son, took a moment and tried to overthrow his dad. When I'm talking about overthrow, she's trying to kill his dad trying to kill his father. His father leaves Jerusalem. He's on the run now. Uh, he's the king. He leaves the capital to get out of the harm's way of his son. And I think part of that is, and we'll see as we go through this story, that he could have took him out right up front. Yet it's his son. And we'll see his deep love for his son. Even though his son has gone bad um, because of what's happened, his deep love for his son. Even Ahithophel here in the very first couple words in chapter 17 is a guy that was somebody that he loved. Somebody was a counselor of his. But Ahithophel had a grudge against David, if you know the backstory, because who's Ahithophel? Ahithophel who's, who's this guy? That's, that's grandpa. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that is Bathsheba's grandfather. All right, so, that, so that's a little, so there's a lot of bitterness in this. So Ahithophel is here. Now there, again, David's on the run, and, and, and Absalom is just coming to power, his son, to, to try to take him out. And now Ahithophel has come over to, to Absalom's camp and, and tried to be his counselor. So he tells him, he says, this is what you need to do. He says, let me choose 12,000 men. He's got a big army. 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight, verse 2 of chapter 17. And I will come upon him while he was weary and discouraged and throw him into a panic. And all the people who are with him will flee. And I will strike down only the king. Think about that even line right there. He's still the king, all right? Even though Absalom's trying to become king, he's still the king. I will strike, I will kill just your dad. And I'll bring all the people back to you 
As a bride comes home to her husband, a great celebration, you seek the life of what we... Uh, you seek the life of only one man and all the people will be at peace. And the advice seemed right in the eyes of Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Okay, so he says, look, let, let's just give me, give me an army. I'll go in and I'll just kill your dad. I'll just kill him. And then we'll come back and be like a big party, big celebration. They'll come back and you will be the king. He says, okay, well, that sounds good. Uh, let me ask this other counselor. Uh, Hushai is, now Hushai is a guy that is a counselor to him, but he's also a spy for David. He's very loyal to David. Absalom doesn't know that. But he says this, he says, let's see, he says, uh, he came to Absalom and Absalom said to him, uh, he said, this is what Ahithophel has spoken. Shall we do as he says? And if not, you speak. If the, should we do what he says? This is what he said. Let's go kill dad. You know, Hushai said this, he says, this time the, the, the counsel of Ahithophel has, has, is, is given is not good. Verse 8, Hushai said, You know that your father and his men are mighty men, and that they are enraged like a bear robbed by our cubs in the field. Besides, your father, is he's an expert in war, and he will not spend the night with the people. You're not going to be able to catch him easily. He's going to be off. Behold, even as he has hidden himself in one of the pits or or in some other place. And as soon as the people fall at the first attack, whoever hears it will say, uh, there has been a great slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Then the valiant men and those whose heart is like the heart of a lion will utterly melt with fear. For all the Israel, Israel knows that your father, he's a mighty man of war. And those who are with him are valiant men. These guys are warriors. But the council is that all Israel be gathered to you from Dan to Beersheba as the sand by the sea of the multitude. Then you, Absalom, you go out to battle in person. So we will come upon him in, in some place where he is, is to be found and you shall light upon him as the dew falls on the ground and, and of him and all the people with him, not one will be left. If he draws into the city, if he goes into a city, then all Israel will they'll bring ropes and we'll tear that city down. We'll drag it into the valley and not even a pebble will be found in that city. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, said the council of Hushai, the Agarite, is better than the council of Ahithophel. And this is why the Lord had ordained to defeat the, the good council of Ahithophel so that the Lord might bring harm upon Absalom. God, God's, he's God's chosen sides. He has David in mind on this. Ishai, you know, Ishai says, hey, look, don't do, don't go after him right now. You do know your dad is a man of war. You do know the guys with him. They will take you out. And besides, you're not going to catch David. He's, he's going to be separated from the troops. And so no, wait until you get everyone behind you and then you go out and lead the battle. Okay, well, that's going to work out well for him. Watch what happens. Watch what he can do. Hushai said, uh, now, Hushai, again, this guy is a spy for David, right? No, he doesn't know this. I don't know why then, you know, King of Thrones and all that stuff. Uh, I don't know why they didn't make a movie of this stuff. This is so much better. There's so much intrigue and little, uh, you know, sabotage and all this stuff in here. And, um, and you don't need all the weirdness that they had in Game of Thrones. I didn't watch that. I only watched like a couple episodes and went, wow, that's like, I shouldn't watch that. Let me just watch one more. All right, so... <laughs> So, you know, I did not watch that. <laughs> if you watch every season that did not get convicted somewhere in your heart, that's kind of messed up. Just saying, just saying, because I got through, I, could, I, I tried to muscle through a bunch of them and I couldn't do it. I got too convicted. So, yeah, I didn't watch any of them, huh? See, good for you. Good for you, because you didn't have a TV, did you? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, see. <laughs> I'm not going to ask how many people watch that stuff because just shame on you. You shouldn't watch that stuff. <laughs> if you did, just repent and don't do it anymore. So, but I read this. I read this. This is an intriguing, you know, story. You have all these little, little pieces going on, you know, and you have Hushai that's there. You have Zadok uh, and Abathar the priest. These guys are also, the priests are also CIA agents. They're also agents for David. Okay, and so they, but they look like they're part of uh, uh, part of Absalom's group. 
So he, so he goes there and tells the priest, he says, thus, and so did Ahithophel counsel Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus, to, and thus, and so have I counseled. So he goes, look, this is what's happened. This is what I told him. All right, we need to get this, get the word to David. Now, therefore, saying quickly and tell David, verse 15, uh, so now stay tonight at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. Now, 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 Jonathan and Ahimaaz were waiting at in Eroth, and a female servant was to go and to tell them. Okay, so this is kind of like the line of, of the spies. The guy was going to come and tell them to go tell David, to tell David when they enter the city. Verse eighteen. But a young man sees this happening, sees and told, went and told a little snitch saw this, and he went and told he went and told Absalom. Okay, hey, this this gal. All right, has is hiding spies, and they they work with they work with David. So both of them went away quickly and came to the house of a man named Baharam, and who had a well in his courtyard. And they came down to it, and the woman took and, and spread a cover over the well's mouth, put some grain over the top of it, kind of hiding the well, and nothing was known of it. Now, when Absalom's servant had come uh, to the woman at the house, they said, "Where is Amahaz and Jonathan? Where's your, where's the spies?" And the woman said to them, they have gone over the brook. They've, gone, they, they, they've already left. And so when they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, the men came up out of the well and went and told King David. And they said to him, arise and go quickly over the water, okay, over Jericho and the Jordan and that, all that. He says, thus says, for thus has, has Ahithophel's counsel against you. When David arose and all the people were with him, they crossed the Jordan by daybreak. Not one was left who had not crossed the Jordan. That kind of gives a barrier, a little buffer, so for when the battle comes. Now, Ahithophel now, the grandpa, he saw that they weren't listening to his counsel. So he saddled his donkey. He went home to his own house. He set his house in order, and he hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father's. That's like a total, totally spoil sport right there, all right? They, weren't, they, they didn't take his counsel, so he said, all right, I'm done, I'm done. He went home, put everything in order, and then hung himself, all right? That's like really bad, bad behavior right there. Then David came to Mahaim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men. And now Absalom had sent uh, Amasa over the army instead of Joab, so Absalom now gives himself a new general. Move Joab, get a new general in there. Uh, uh, Amasa was the son of a man, and there's his little genealogy right there. Uh, then David came to Mahaim, and, and, uh, and then for verse 26, you kind of have the supply line. Okay, You have those that are supporting him, has some names there. Um, they're, they're supporting him with uh, earthen vessels, with weed and barley and flour and and beans and lentils and honey and curves and good sheep and just all those that are supplying him and helping him, the people uh, and the people with him to eat. And they said uh, the people are hungry and they're weary and thirsty in the wilderness. And so there's all the those that are helping David, kind of the supply line right there. Verse 1, chapter 18, Then David mustered the men who were with him and said over the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, and David, now listen, to the army, he's got a pretty good-sized army right there. Set over him commanders of thousands, commanders of hundreds. David sent out the army, one-third under the command of Joab, one-third under the command of Abishai, the son of Zerah, and, and Joab's brother, and one-third under the command of Atei, uh, um, the Gittite. If you remember, this guy was, he's probably, if you kind of get his backstory, he he just came and just as David was leaving, he came he was on the he came on the scene. And David says, Hey, don't follow me. This is a bad time for you to kind of join us. And he goes, No, if you die, I die, I'm with you. I'm with you. Well, you look at the backstory of this guy, he was he was a Philistine and probably one of the generals of the Philistines that's joining him. And so you have you have these guys that that are coming to King David, and here you have one in, in King. So what David has done is taken all of his army break them up into three different groups, right? And this, this, this general's got one group, okay? 
I'm, I, he says, so you guys, I'm going to break you guys up. You take hundreds over thousands and, and you guys, and then I'm going to go with you, David says. I myself will go out with you. But the men said, no, you shall not go out. For if we flee, they will not care about us. If half of us die, they will not care about us. But you are worth 10,000 of us. Therefore, it is better that you send us uh, help from the city. Says, no, you stay in the city. No, 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 you're not coming with us. They're coming after you. If they kill you, you're worth 10,000 of us. If, you kill, if they kill you, game over, game over. All right, so no, you stay here. We'll go fight the battle. David says, whatever seems best to you, do it. So that, that's actually not a bad plan. I'll stay here. You guys go out there and, and take these guys out. That the king stood at the gate, and while here comes the army marching by as they're getting ready to go out, he's encouraging them and all. And the, but the king brought the generals together, Joab, Abishai, and Atai. He brought them together, and he said, "Listen, you guys deal gently for my sake with young Absalom. My son, be nice to him. All right, he's he's actually the the main instigator of what's all this that's going on. He says you be nice to him, you don't hurt him, be gentle to him. Okay, that's that's like." you know, weird advice. We'll talk about that a little bit. But yeah, just that, just weird. Okay, you be gentle to him. Now all the people heard that, they heard it. He said it in the, others heard that command about Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel and the battle was fought in the force of Ephraim and the men of Israel were defeated uh, by the servants of David and the loss was great on that day. Big battle. 20,000 men, the battle spread over the face of the country. Okay, huge, massive battle. And the forest devoured more people than the day, that day with the sword. In other words, the, the, the terrain, really tough terrain, uh, and that was part of the battle. If you know anything about uh, you know, strategy and battles, uh, the terrain is what's important. It's the battlefield that's important. Many times it's the battlefield is going to determine who's going to win of where you're, where you're staged at. You look at Revolutionary War, or actually look at Revolutionary War, and, and one of the generals came over here to fight. I don't know if you guys care about this stuff, but one of the generals came over. Burgoyne came over here to fight, brought all of his little, brought his whole family, brought all this, these wagons filled with stuff, didn't understand the terrain in America. And just because of the, the terrain alone took him out. All right, and that was a major player in the Revolutionary War because he didn't understand the terrain here in America. I mean, there was trees. There were so many trees, they said, you could, um, uh, that a, a squirrel could jump from coast to coast without ever touching the ground because of the, because of the trees. Well, that was an exaggeration, but you understand how many, how many trees there were. And this guy gets there and he doesn't understand the, the, the swamps that he's got to deal with and the terrain he's got to deal with. It's the same thing here, right? So uh, big, so terrain problem. That was just as bad for the battle as it was for those in Absalom's army, not, not understand the terrain. So Absalom uh, happened to meet the servants of David. Now, Absalom was riding on a mule, okay? I don't think that's a fast getaway car, all right? A mule, come on, come on. Okay, so he's on a mule. Now, he's going under thick branches of an, of an oak, a, of, a, of a tree. Now, his head, remember, this guy's got long hair, all right? He's got, the Bible talked about his hair, all right? His head gets caught in the, so he's going under, this mule's going under these branches and his hair gets caught in the branches, but the mule keeps going and he's, he's hanging there by his hair. Okay, boy, that's a sight. Well, the mule was, uh, went under, and, and uh, now a certain man saw it and told Joab. Okay, hey, Joab, I saw, I saw Absalom, he's hanging from a tree by his hair. Come over here, I'll show it to you, you know? And he goes, oh, he sees that. So I saw Absalom hanging from an oak, and Joab said to the man, he says, why, what you saw him, why did you not strike him? Why didn't you kill him? He says, I would, I would have been glad to, to give you 10 pieces of silver, and I'll give you this belt. If you'd have killed him, I'd have rewarded you. The man says, no way, Jose. He says, even if I felt in my, even if I felt in my hand the weight of 10,000 pieces of silver, I would not reach out my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, we heard what he said. The king commanded you, Abishai and Natalia, you guys are not, we're not to kill this kid. Okay, so you give me whatever you want. I'm not going to come against David. David. David will cut my head off. Okay, and for my sake, uh, my, for my sake, protect the, the young man, Absalom. Verse 13, on the other hand, if I had dealt treacherously with his life 
and there is nothing hiding, there's nothing hidden from the king, he'd have known, then you yourself would have stepped, you yourself would not have protected me. I'm not going to kill that kid. Jeb says, look, I'm, Jeb says, the general says, well, look, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm wasting my time with you. You, know, you just shut up. And then he took three javelins in his hand and threw them right through the body, through the heart of Absalom while he was still in the oak. And then 10 of the young men, the guys that were there, the armor bearers of Joab, surround Absalom and then just, just kind of hacked him to death. Okay, brutal. And then Joab blew the trumpet. The troops came back pursuing Israel, and Joab restrained them. And they took Absalom and threw him into the great pit in the forest and raised over him a great heap of stones. And all Israel fled, uh, every one, to his own home. Absalom, in his lifetime, had, had taken and had set up for himself the pillar that is in the king's valley. For he said, no, I don't have any sons, and my name will not be remembered. Okay, nobody's going to remember my name. So he called the pillar after his own name and called the uh, uh, Absalom's monument to this day. All right, so if you go to Israel today, uh, just outside of the, uh, of the Temple Mount area, up on the Mount of Olives, down in the little valley down there, you'll see some monuments down there. There's a monument down there that looks like a little pyramid that's down there, and that's Absalom's tomb. Now, is that this one? That's what they'll tell you. It's this one. Is it, there's much debate over that of whose tomb that is, but there still is a tomb there today called Absalom's tomb. And when you go to Israel with us, and January 9th is when we leave, Lord willing, January 9th and the, or the 19th, whichever one you want to go to, um, that's when we're, that's, that's our plan to go next time. All right? Just to let you know. You don't need any shots, and let's pray you don't have to wear a mask. Okay? Some of you should wear a mask all the time, just saying. All right, just saying, or, or makeup or something. All right, so. All right, so he talks about Absalom's tomb here. Um, in ver, where was that at? Okay, we're on this side of the page. All right, so. Now, Moss, the son of uh, Zadok, had said, okay, so, so now Absalom's dead. Okay, David doesn't know it yet. Okay, the, the battle's over, okay, all, everybody's standing down. Now, uh, Amos, the son of Zadok, said, uh, he said, let me run and carry the news to the king that, that the Lord has delivered him from the hand of the enemies. Let me go tell him. I'll go tell him. Do you realize what you're doing? I don't think he's very smart. David don't take news like this very well. Has it in the past. Job said, uh, you're not going to carry the news today. Uh, you may carry the news another day, but... But today you shall not carry this news uh, because the king's son is dead. No, nope, you don't want to tell him that. That's not, that's not the news you want to tell him. I care about you and I don't want you to tell him. But then Joab gets this Cushite, this guy from Ethiopia, okay, one of these foreigners. He said, you go tell him, all right? So he goes, okay. So he goes to, so he starts running. Cushite bowed before Joab and then, and then began to run, began to run to David. Him as the son of Zadok, he said, Job, hey, he says, uh, uh, come what may, let me run with, uh, let me just run with him, right? Let me just run with him. Job says, why will you run, my son? Seeing that you don't have any, you have no reward for the news. You don't have good news you can give him. What, so you don't have any news. Why do you want to go there? Let him do it. Said, come what may, he says, I'll run. I don't, whatever happens, I want to run with him. He says, okay. So he said, run. Him as ran. So he runs, uh, by the way, on the plains, and he outran the foreigner, the Cushite. The David was sitting between the gates, and the watchman went up on the roof of the gate and, and the wall and was kind of watching out there. And they saw a young man running alone. The watchman came and told, told David, he said, hey, there's a man coming, and there's good news in it alone. Uh, this, is, this is news. There's, he's got news in his mouth. Okay, he's got something to tell you. And uh, the watchman uh, saw another man running, and the watchman called uh, to the gate, and he says, see, there's, oh, wait a minute, there's two of them coming here, okay? And they, uh, they're bringing news. He says, I think the one that's running is Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. He says, I recognize that, that kid that's running right there. That's the priest's son. So, and, and he's a good man, so he's got to be coming with good news. Verse 28, uh, Ahimaaz, uh, uh, he cried out to the king, he says, all is well. And he bowed before the king, huffing and puffing, as he just ran to him and his face to the earth. He said, blessed be the Lord God 
who has delivered up the man who has raised their hands against the Lord my king. Okay, you, the battle's over. We won. It's over. David says, is it all well with my, with my son? Is the young man Absalom, how's he doing? Uh, him as he catches this, he says, well, um, Joab sent the, uh, the king's mess and the, the king's servants, uh, your servant uh, was a great commotion, but I don't know what happened. So he says, look, I, I don't know. I saw a big commotion. I don't, I, 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 I don't know. That's a lie. He knew exactly what happened. All right, he just goes, I, I, I don't know. Well, you better ask somebody else. Okay, so at that time, uh, here comes the, the Ethiopian guy. He runs up. He came and he says, he says, good news for my Lord the King and for the uh, Lord the King has delivered you this day from the hands of all who rose up. And the king said to the Cushite, is it well with the son, young man Absalom? That's all he cares about. I'm not the battle. Is my son okay? He says, may the enemies of the Lord, the king, and all those who rise up against you for evil be just like that young man is. The king was deeply moved and went up on the chamber before the gate and wept. And he said, oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Wow. That's going to be a major problem right there. He's going to have to fix that. All right. Because this was, even though it's his son, he still was the one that caused all the grief, right? And he's saying, oh, my son, my son, you know, you see, you see a man's heart for his kid, no matter what his kid has done. And that's just, if you got kids, you know exactly what that's like. It doesn't matter what your kid has done. You know, you are not, you are not that heartless to where you don't love your kids, no matter what they've done, no matter what they've done, you still love your kids. And that's what he's doing. You know, I love this little passage right here because there's many pastors that'll take it and say, this is, this is, this is like God and how God treats us. You know, here's, here's our son in rebellion. And yet the heart of the father is so poured out and loves their kids. And boy, this will preach, man. You go 20 minutes on this right here. You know, just all the connections between David's heart and Absalom, how much he loved Absalom and, and how he's heartbroken over this and how God loves his kids. He loves his kids, even though our, because of us, we want our father dead. Well, no, your sins, your sins, he, he, we're placed upon him. Okay, so again, this, you, you can put a, lot of, put a lot of things in here. I, just, I look at that and I hear pastors preach on this and I heard someone uh, recently preach on this little thing right here. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful that God loves me and I'm an idiot. You know, don't agree with that. Okay, but the, the, the love that he loves me, agree with that. Okay. Um, let me show you something. Before I get on to what happens next, he gets rebuked for that, for his behavior right there. Uh, if you remember now, uh, when we started this, I gave you a handout that's on the back table back there. Is This is how we're going through the Bible, okay, in chronological order. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Psalms written right here. Right before, right before the capture, uh, or, well, the death of Absalom, there he wrote some Psalms. Let me show you just a couple of them. Hold your place here. We're going to come back. Go to Psalm, let's start in, let's just do two of them. Go to Psalm 26. Let me show you two of these, and then we'll come back. Uh, Psalm 26, David says, and again, some of these are straight up. We know exactly where he wrote them, and some of them are kind of, we're just kind of inferring from what he says and history background. This is one of those ones we're just inferring, and it's it's from the historical background of of. of of scribes that are, are writing earlier about this uh, that David wrote during this time. But he says, vindicate me, O Lord. Vindicate me. If you have another translation, judge, you know, judge me, O Lord. That's pretty heavy. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O, o Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. Sounds a lot like the 139th Psalm, you know, test me, oh, not know my heart and know my anxious thoughts, you know, and same, same kind of formatting here. For your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in your faithfulness. Even though he's a dingling, writing stuff like this, and you know it's coming from his heart, you see why we're still talking about David, you know, Lord, vindicate me, judge me, Lord. I've walked in integrity before you. I've trusted in the Lord without wavering. 
I've tried really hard. Prove me, O God, and try me. Test my heart and my mind, and your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I will walk in the faithfulness. Do not, I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I uh, consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I am, I am really judging who I hang out with. I wash my hands in innocence and go, uh, go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming the thanks, thanksgiving aloud. I go to church, I go into the, the church of the day, and I'm proclaiming your faithfulness, telling all of your wonders and deeds, Lord. Oh, Lord, I love the inhabitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. I love being in your presence. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men. And those hands are evil evil devices in whose right hand are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Now that's not a lie. He, he absolutely is this, is, this is his life. I'm walking in my integrity, Lord. Help me. Redeem me. Be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground in the, in the great assembly. I will bless the Lord. You know, you hear this. Is, Lord, I'm trying really hard. I'm walking in integrity. Lord, I, I pray. I don't go with sinners. I don't hang out with them. Lord, help me to do the right thing. Help me to do the right thing. Let's do one more. Let's go to Psalm 58. Another one during this time. This one's cool. Do not destroy is the song. Verse 1, it says, he says, Do you indeed decree that is right, you gods or you lords, you son of men, with some of your translations? Do, the, do, the, uh, do you judge the children of man uprightly? No. In your, in your hearts, you devise wrong. Your hands deal out violence on earth. In other words, are you in, what he's saying here is kind of a very colorful way of saying, are you in charge? Do you think you're in charge now? Whether it's Elohim's, whether it's God's or it's Lord's, or most of the translations will be the Son of Man. Uh, that's beside the point. Uh, the real thing is, you're not in charge. God's in charge of this. Do you think you're in charge? No, you're not in charge. You're not in charge. And your hearts devise wickedness. Wrong. Your hands dealt out violence on earth. You're not in charge. The wicked are estranged from the womb and, and they go astray from birth speaking lies. They are venom like the, the venoms of a serpent, like the, the deaf adder that stops its ears so that it does not hear the voice of chambers or, or of the cunning enchanters. Oh God, <laughs> I love this verse right here. Oh God, Break the teeth in their mouth. I'm going to knock you out. Tear out the fangs of the young lion, O oh Lord. Be careful what you pray, though. Look, look, the, here, here, here's, what, here's what he's doing. He's just making that declaration. Doesn't matter. They're not in control. David lived like this. You know, you leave him alone. Maybe God is in this. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lift my hand against the uh, God's anointed. God's in this. He could have killed Saul more than once, but he didn't because God's in this. This is God's thing. This is not my battle. This is God's battle. He says, "But God, God, I'm asking you. Is this a good prayer? Break their teeth, Lord. Break their teeth. I kind of like that prayer. Let them vanish like water that runs away." When he aims his arrow, and let let them be blunted. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. That's nice little. You don't you ever put you ever pour like salt on a on a snail? That's just mean, but it's interesting to watch them bubble. All right, so <laughs> like the stubborn child who never sees the sun sooner uh, sooner than your pots can fill the heat of thorns. Whether green or ablaze, may he sweep them away. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the, the vengeance. He will, he will bathe his feet in the blood of the wicked. Boy, it's a different time period there. Mankind, mankind will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is a God who judges the earth. Be careful what you pray. He's praying this right here against his enemies. Who's his enemy? Well, his son is leading his enemies. I bust his teeth out, Lord. You get him. Maybe, maybe like a snail that just bubbles when you get him. 
you know. Absalom, Absalom, my son Absalom, you know. And so you got to be careful what you pray. I think it's okay to pray, honestly. I prayed, God, get them. Okay, but, I, but I've all, and you guys have heard me talk about this if you come here very long, because this, this was a learning thing for me, you know, because I really was really mad at some people. And I'm pastor. I'm standing right here and standing right here before the church, talking about the love of Jesus and all that. And in my heart, I want to kill somebody. I actually want them dead. I'm so mad, and I'm so mad at what they've done. I'm so mad at what they've done to my family. I'm so mad at the gossip and stuff that happened. And I'm there, and I'm saying, Lord, and I'm praying, Lord, bust their teeth out. Lord, I pray they get up this morning and their car is broken and they lose their job and all of this. And Lord, I pray, listen, Lord, I pray you would change my heart. And, and you know what happened? It works. It works. Because, it, and I had to, I've confessed this to the church many, many times because it was, it was kind of shocked me. Because the next day I go to pray, God bust their teeth out. I want you to, and I can't do it. Okay, Lord. Okay, change my heart. The next day I go to prayer. I can't, I, I can't, I can't pray like that anymore. And pretty soon I'm asking God, would you, when they wake up this morning, would you bless them? You know, really? <laughs> really? Are you really going to take me there, Lord? Okay, Lord, bless them. Bless them with cancer, you know, you know. <laughs> and yet, and yet, it, for me, it did not take very long. And I was surprised. The Bible says a root of bitterness, if allowed to grow, will defile many. And that root of bitterness started getting in my heart. And I didn't want it there. I don't like that. I don't like hatred in my heart. I don't want it in my heart. And I wanted this person. I had, I had can I tell you this? Okay, I had, I had dreams of, of, of going over, knocking on his door, and when he answers his door, shooting him. You know, that's how mad I was, all right? Yeah, I'm a violent person, but God has done a work in me, okay? Praise God, I didn't do that, huh? I'd have a prison ministry right now, all right? And so, but, so, I, so I was telling the Lord, Lord, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. And so, Lord, changed my heart. And I was, and so I was so deep in this anger over what, what, what had happened um, and, and it's not all their fault either, okay? We all, you know, own your, own your part in it. But the thing is this, is that, is that I was so deep in that anger and I was, I was really shocked by the Lord on how fast he brought me out when I got serious with him. Lord, help me. Help me to forgive. Help me to not feel this way. Lord, get this bitterness out of my heart. And it took a while. It took prayer every day. Lord, get this bitterness out of my heart. Lord, get this bitterness out of my heart. And you know what he did? He did. To where I saw this person, actually invited him to lunch, so I could look him in the face and see, did I want to take this fork and stick it in his neck, or did I want to just say, it's gone? And I looked across the table and I go, I, I really, before the Lord, I went, wow, it's totally gone. It's totally gone. I can be your friend now. You know, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for that. It's because I'm such an honorable person. No, I'm a dork. It's because God's principles work. Because God's principles work. You know, when you, when you say, Lord, I want to change, and this is what I'm doing, Lord, I want to change in this, what does God do? He'll change us. But you've got to be willing to change. You've got to own it. If you don't own it, if I didn't own that, it's their fault, Lord. It's their fault. I did right. They did wrong. I still want them dead. I, would, to this, I don't know that I'd be, a, I'd be a pastor now. I think, I think that he had removed me because my bitterness was so deep, was, had gotten so deep. Instead, instead, what he did is he, he taught me how to forgive. He taught me how to love. He taught me how to change those things. And now when it comes, and it still does, I'm still, I'm still a person that har harbors stuff in my heart. When it does, I deal with it very quickly. Okay, Lord, I, I, I would really, I really want you to bless my friend. I want you to bless him with a really good job and move him out of the country. Okay, <laughs> move him out of the country. Move him, maybe... Um, Maybe someplace like Siberia. Move him there. Great job. There's great jobs in Siberia. Move him there, Lord. And so, you know, keep short accounts with God. If tonight, if tonight you got some kind of harbor, some kind of bitterness in your heart towards somebody, start the process right now. Start the process giving it to God and, and watch what he does. But I tell you what, it only works if you're honest with God. It does not work playing church. It does not work when you're sitting there going, you know, God, I want to forgive them. 
but I hate them. And I hate them with, a, as David said, I hate them with a perfect hatred. You know, I'm a <laughs> biblical person. Bust their teeth out, Lord. And Lord, change my heart. Change my heart. In that 39, in the 139 Psalms, one of my favorite Psalms, uh, because, because it's, it's actually been something that I've memorized over the years because it's, it's such a, you know, you search me and you know me, you know my, my going out, my coming forth, you intimately with, Canaan, with all my ways. And, and in that Psalm, he says, do, do I not hate them with a perfect hatred? You know, but then at the end of that, at the end of that, he did exactly what I'm saying. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart and know my anxious thoughts. And Lord, see if there's any offensive way of me and lead me in the way everlasting. If there's one prayer that I prayed more than any other prayer in my entire life, it's that prayer. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Search me, God. Is there things I need to change? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And know my anxious thoughts. Man, I'm anxious sometimes. Know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any offensive way in me. Boy, there's a lot. I got a list. It's, it changes and it morphs into, into, you know, small list, long list, depends on what day it is, you know. No make just thought, see if there's any offensive way of me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let me, let me out of this stuff. If you want, if, if you want to, our, I love King David. This guy is so, so deeply screwed up. And yet, look at his heart. Yet, look at, he knew the principles of coming out of this stuff. What if these stories were all about people that were perfect and never messed up? Forget it then. Forget it. That ain't going to happen. I praise God that the grand heroes of the, church, of the church, the grand heroes of the stories of the Bible had problems. There's only a couple of them and that's, and, and, you know, that's the way God has it mapped out. You know, there's only Daniel and maybe Joseph. Yeah. Joseph's got some funny things in there, but, but Daniel would be one that says, man, here's a God. So you can live in integrity. You can live a life without all the stupid stuff. Uh, you just won't end up in this church, all right? So, <laughs> Sam, okay. <laughs> stupid relates to, you know, we're, we all have that. Ba- we just relate better if you have a background, all right? I'm just saying, all right? So it's true. It's true. Father, we love you a lot. And Lord, uh, thank you for these stories. Lord, as we see just a lot of pain and we see a lot of difficulties, Lord, but it, it, we see that every single one of these, these dark stories, Lord, we see the glimmer of you, your faithfulness, your love. We see you loving your people no matter how messed up they were. And we see a man, Lord, that it's easy to criticize David. It's harder to emulate him. It's harder, Lord, to say, make my heart like his. Lord, that I'll be forgiving and loving. And and Lord, these Psalms that came out of David, Lord, that they'd be within our hearts, that we would praise you and keep our eyes on you. So Lord, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for this family. Lord, always, that this would always be a safe place to learn about you. That's our heart's cry. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. We trust in you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. amen and amen. All right.